Welcome back to the 615 Sessions podcast. We got Kayla Anderson of WKRN News 2. We got Johnny Glennon of Sports Illustrated with us today, an early arriving edition of the 615 Sessions podcast, an actual football practice to talk about players to watch and to discuss. Um, and, you know, uh, a lot of good content being produced by everybody right now. It feels good to be getting back into the swing of things. Um, we got to start, though, with this Mike Vrabel punching bag video that I'm sure Taylor Lewan got his ass cussed out for. Um, I, I, I sent some feelers out yesterday, Johnny, about betting odds on whose face among us of Titans media would be on the punching bag. And I think odds on Paul Kaharski is the favorite. But I honestly think you would have sneaky good value if we were to place – if we were to oh, place you, you know, uh, 25 so to one hurtful. or something so like hurtful, that. hurtful, Buck. I, I, I think I'm down the list, but regardless, I, I would agree with you that our friend PK is head and shoulders uh, above the competition there. Kayla, hey. who, do, who do you think is, who do you think is second, if not Johnny? Wow. That's a really good question. Um, because it's not going to be any of the females in the market because that would just be probably wrong yeah um i mean i don't you know guys pass garbage i think i think he likes to pick on you so not not for the fact that you've done anything i just think for the fact of ratings getting you in there in the ring yeah. and, or putting your face on it i think that's what most of the twitter followers uh that we all have are saying you you so mean you're, to tell you're me that Mike, two you mean to tell me that Mike Vrabel would be using my likeness for clout? I hardly think that Mike's that ba down bad. I think he's where, probably. Where do we think? What, what about our, our old friend uh, uh, Jared Buck? You know, surely he's yes. got a factor into the mix there okay. now as, as well. You know, Stillman probably does belong on the on the medal stand, but it's it's kind of like I don't know. I'm probably in the same spot now. Neither of us are there often enough to uh -huh. draw the ire, even though Mentorgate is directly. Uh, a product of Jared Stillman's question asking, and this is this whole circumstance. It's ingenious by him, as a matter of fact. He's done he's done quite well with it. I think he got a decent enough run. I honestly think had we been doing this in the Zoom era, that Terry McCormick would probably beat out yes. Paul. I think that Terry's inability to figure out the internet, you know, mm -hmm. into basically a year and a half of COVID was uh, outstanding. Mm -hmm. But I think now that we've gone non-virtual, I I kind of. I kind of think Ben Arthur belongs at the top and I don't understand why. I, I, yeah, okay. There, there's, yeah. There are some no, ones ahead, that are JG. hard to figure. And, and certainly, you know, uh, uh, Mike Frable would, would constantly reference last year, Ben, I know this is your first year on the beat, but this is not the way, this is not what we have, blah, blah, blah. So Ben, yeah, Ben might have some sneaky value as well in there. Which I think is ridiculous for the oh, fact sure. that Ben is such a good dude and uh, came in here during you know just not the normal time really still not the normal time and you know he wasn't afraid to ask questions but yeah. at the same time I think Vrabel definitely puts his intimidation on on reporters and he just decided to pick Ben out of the whole bunch and so I don't know what it is a, a, about Ben that he has some I'm not going to say hate for that's too strong of a word, but you know, <laughs> likes to pick on him. So I think you're on to something there. You Buck. definitely got a thing. I think it's the length of the questions. Like I, that I, might catch, be it. I, th I catch myself doing that from time to time. Who among us is not guilty of asking a drawn out question, I know. but yeah, it's a, it's a weird phenomenon going on between Ben Arthur and, uh, and Mike Rabel, especially given that Ben is probably the least offensive of any of us who are regularly in attendance at Titans practice, but there's actually well, things to talk about. I thought, go ahead, Jen. No, I was just going to say he's got a lot of years to become as offensive as we are. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Uh, actual football practice. We are taping this on a Thursday afternoon. Tuesday was the open OTA for us. I believe next Tuesday is our next Wednesday. opportunity. Next Wednesday is our next opportunity to get out on the practice field and kind of see what there is to see. Uh, Johnny, I, uh, I enjoyed your, uh, your piece this morning on Traylon Burks, the new Titans mystery man. <laughs> <laughs> for all of these things that continue to swirl around the rookie first round pick. I, what, what, I don't want to give the whole article away because of course people need to go to si.com to read said Thank article. You. Thank you. Um, yeah. But just, just in general, why, why did you, why did you take the approach that you did and what kind of makes Traylon Burks such a fascinate, uh, fascination through three training camp practices? Yeah, three, well, three well I mean, he's a fascination in the first place for the simple fact that he is a first round pick that there are serious expectations that he will deliver immediately. 
because A.J. Brown is not here and the Titans need somebody to step up in addition to Robert Woods. Uh, and from the simple fact that the Titans' last two first-round picks have, to this point, contributed very little and one never will, obviously. Uh, so, so there are some natural reasons to be watching Traylon Burks. And, you know, I don't want to overblow a situation, uh, you know, but the fact is that your first round draft pick could literally not make it through the first drill on the first day of rookie minicamp that he left the field and at some point used an inhaler uh, and that even the last two times that we have seen him, he has not been a full participant uh, in, in either of those practices. So my question, you know, I think he's certainly getting clubbed over the head by a lot of people on social media that say he's fat, he's out of condition, yada yada and that's the natural suspicion you, you know when something like this happens so my question is is it more than than just out of condition though and and the the one reason i guess i bring that up is inhaler I, i've never seen anybody you know just when they're tired you know say hey i gotta have an inhaler an inhaler and i'll, and I'll be back at it in no time um you know and and second do we really believe that, that you know, a, an SEC caliber athlete, a stud in the SEC tumbled completely out of condition in the last couple of months to the point that he couldn't go through one drill? Is he really that bad out of condition? If that is the case, wow. Um, but, you know, if it's not the case, maybe somebody should speak up and say, hey, stop crushing this guy for being out of shape. It's more than that. Yeah, but Kayla, we, we, we go through this every year with Brable in some form or fashion where whether it's, you know, whether it's Derrick Henry in a stress fracture or Traylon Burks in a, or an inhaler, like there's no variance in the idea that Mike's just not going to give a shit. Like okay. we're just not, we're not going to, we're not going to go there. And God forbid you ask him about pollen <laughs> the, way that, the way that our guy PK did, which, you know, I it's mean. It's legit, by the way. Yeah. Right. Yo, no, the pollen is brutal. I, I, uh, I was, I was getting choked up uh, Johnny and, and PK and I went to the Nashville SC game and I, I was yeah. legitimately having trouble a couple of weeks ago, um, getting through that comfortably. But anyway, point being Mike, Mike is so state st secret with anything regarding the player's physical condition that it is, it creates a story where there may not necessarily need be one now as somebody who does sports talk radio and this time of year is uh you know prone to speculation anyway i it's i far be it for me to complain about the idea that this is a thing and that people have the ability to continue to wander about this kind of stuff but i think that i think i understand why mike does it but I don't understand why it's just a blanket thing, especially when he knows that there's going to be so much scrutiny on this dude. I think that's a major issue. And I think it has been a major issue. And I, I understand the way that Vrabes does things to protect players. It's part of the Patriot way, but you know, when I'm on a plane flying home and I have some random stranger next to me asking who's not from Tennessee, who's not a Titans fan, asking what's going on with the first round pick for the Titans. Why is he so out of shape? Uh, this is a storyline that people read about throughout the country because the Titans are starting to have eyes on them. And in, in some ways, it's a very good thing. In other ways, when it's something like this and there's no explanation for it, then it grows limbs or it grows hands of their own and, and everybody's wondering what in the heck is going on with this first round pick and I thought for sure that Traylon would be made available this week or Vrabel or would rookie at least, mini camp or rookie mini camp or at least have some sort of explanation to us as to what's going on I think it really hurts them as an organization to not say a word because it just keeps the conversation going and usually it's not going to go in the direction that they'd like it to go in. So I just don't understand why we can't just come out with some sort of a statement. Um, it makes you wonder what really is going on. And if there's nothing going on, then why not just come and say, it's something that, that there's nothing to worry about and he'll be ready to go training camp. Uh, you know, I don't get that. I think Vrabel did that a little bit, Johnny, because he said there's no limitations on, on Burks right now, which would indicate, um, you know, that he should be able to finish a practice. 
But yeah, I, I, if you if you parse words, and, and a, lot, a lot of times we are we are left parsing words with with Mike Brabel because he doesn't give out much information in that regard. You know, he he said on the reps he was out there, uh, there were no limitations. Uh, you know, and, and that's not a direct quote, but that there's certainly you no, know that's significant. The intent is what he said, and and what was left unsaid was he's not out there for all the reps though. Why isn't he out there for all the reps? Just as all the rookies are, just as all you know, the other teammates uh, uh, were as well. So, yeah, I, I understand that that Mike Vrabel's intent is is probably to protect players in in some regards, but I don't think it it works a lot of the times because is Traylon Burks being protected right now? No. Right now, everyone thinks, or, or you know, I think the vast majority of people think that he just reported very much out of condition, you know, overweight. And maybe that's the case. And, and if so, okay, but it's not the end of the world. Just say it yeah. and, and say he's working to get better. He didn't realize, you know, what, what was necessary to, to come into an NFL offseason and so forth. And you move on. But now, you know, there's this ridiculous amount of speculation. And, and I'm sitting here, you know, trying to figure out the, the mystery of the inhaler, uh, um, you know, and, and that's where we are. So are you protecting players? Not in my opinion here, but that's for sure. No, I think I think Kayla, your point is well made about him talking. Burke's not well, not talking yes. yeah. whatsoever. Because I mean, it was it was my understanding that they, you know, it was basically a game time decision for us on the second day of rookie minicamp whether he was going to talk or not. And sure. at some point, that decision was made to not put him in mm -hmm. on the podium uh, with the rest of us, as was the expectation. That's a John thing. That's a John Robinson thing, as much right. as it is Mike Vrabel. Because, you know, just in, in and listen, I mean, what, whatever, that's their prerogative. They can do what they like with it. But then this is also going to be a part of the result. Because um, anytime, anytime that I put in a request, for example, or any of us puts in a request to talk to players or interview players or radio or TV or whatever, like that goes to football first. And then football yeah. decides whether that's greenlit or not. So what what the logic is, and John doesn't have to answer for this in ways that Mike does because at the podium. Mm -hmm every week with us but i just i i would be i would be fascinated to know what the logic was in over protecting to the point sure. of you're you are you're right johnny they're kind of they're kind of hanging him out to dry a little bit and i obviously don't think that's their intent well my question is too is i really want to know like what are the players thinking in this situation are they given a choice is Traylon burke sitting there saying i'd like to speak to the media just to clear the situation i'd like to you know whether it be him getting some coaching beforehand on what he should say or shouldn't say that's fine but maybe Traylon wants to talk to the media i'll tell you this right now if i were the athlete and this stuff was going on, I, this is just my personality, but I'd want to get out in front of the media. Maybe that's it's Traylon saying he doesn't want to, but we all know what happened with Bud Dupree last year. We didn't hear from him. We didn't hear from him. And then all of a sudden it was like, he had all this built up stuff to say, and then look at what happened. And then Vrabel was PO'd off. Yeah. I think, for sure. I, I think if I could throw in one, one more thing on that book, it, it's very much in contrast to what they did with Malik Willis. You know, uh, uh, certainly the big question surrounding Malik Willis or, or one of the big questions was, you know, his response, if, if he had any to, to Ryan Tannehill's mentoring comment. So what happened? Malik Willis yes. is there on, on the first day of rookie minicamp. He steps up to the podium. He's asked the question. He deals with it. He was very smooth. Uh, you know, I thought he I thought he handled himself very well. Boom. Any potential crisis yep. done, cleared. You know, there, there were no more questions about it all until actually until Ryan Tannehill brought it up himself again. But that's a different story altogether. But, you know, Malik Willis handled it. And, and uh, you know, that was it. that as opposed to the, the endless uh, speculation that we're now dealing with. Yeah, no, those two hand, uh, Tannehill and Malik Willis, I thought, handled the whole thing pretty gracefully um, Very from, well. from start to finish. And, you know, winning a press conference is is uh is one thing but at, at this time of in this particular offseason that's been just batshit crazy for the titans between trading aj and mentor gate and new stadium and all these different things and i mean everything that that was the result of the way that the season ended it's been a it's been a pretty interesting four months you know i'm i'm, I'm glad that you brought that up though kayla about burks having some kind of some kind of say in whether he wants to talk to us or not because i'm sure he doesn't you know, I, I think, and I, I mean, I, right. Like I, yeah. and he may not, he may not understand the scope of what that 
of what that would alleviate in the way, like I'm sure nobody is saying to him, hey, look how well Malik did. If you just get out there and get it over with, people will move on eventually. I don't, I don't know, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to do anything but say that this is speculation at this point, these different things that um, we're all talking about because, but we are left the opportunity to speculate because of the lack of clarity that we are, uh, that we've been getting on him specifically. But yeah, I mean, he doesn't strike me as somebody who wants to get out there and to get these, these things done. And maybe you want to ask him a couple of questions about killing a, killing a boar with a knife or whatever, and then he can move on with his day. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and here's the thing, you made a good point, Buck, because this rookie class overall, I think there are a lot of great personalities and really from what I've seen talking with some of these guys, uh, they feel pretty comfortable right away with the media, which is not an easy thing, especially when, when the, the tensions on you. And so, or especially one, coming out of college where these guys don't yeah. really get, get put up and especially coming out of COVID coming out of college, sure. where the access is being even more restricted. Right. And so the one guy though, that I will say, cause I sat down with him and, and was one-on-one -on -one with him. And while Traylon was, was fine. Like he had good answers and it, he's a little bit more reserved. I mean, sure. he's a, he's, he's, you know, from Arkansas, he's, he went to Arkansas. This is his first time kind of out of Tennessee and he, she probably feels a little uncomfortable. I think that's fair to say, again, I'm speculating, but from what I've seen, that's kind of my opinion. Yeah. Um, on, on the field, I thought that there was a, a couple of different uh, just observations that I thought were were relevant to our discussion today. I think Austin Hooper is the uh, is the biggest clear and obvious immediate upgrade that that offense is going to have right out of the gate for all the questions that we have about offensive line and wide receiver. Um, I think they've done well already in seeing how much more how much and and uh, OTA OTA seven on seven stuff is not anything to make any grand assessments of, but it's clear that Ryan Tannehill is comfortable working him, working Hooper into the into the rotation with how frequently he was targeted on the day that we were able to get out there, Johnny. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know I I also liked you know Mike Brabel bringing up the the little story he shared with us about Austin Hooper, um, you know last week. Uh, Austin Hooper was out in California, uh, uh, Brabel said, at a, at a charity, you know, raising money for, for foster children. But, you know, his intent in, in, uh, and, and desire to kind of gain chemistry and, and be around his new teammates was great enough that he took a red-eye flight back from California and was on the field for OTs, the OTAs. That's not easy. Day. So, yeah, I, I think that's, a, you know, that paints a very good picture of Austin Hooper. And, and I really got the sense that the chemistry is starting between those two along those same lines. Robert Woods, you know, I, I thought really encouraging to see him out there, you know, sure was wearing the knee brace. But, you know, this is a guy who, who tore his ACL in, in mid-November of last year. So I think it's it's pretty impressive that he was already out there doing what he could. And, and again, when you talk to Ryan Tannehill and, and you hear what Ryan Tannehill is saying about the kind of chemistry that's developing and, and I'm already starting to know what, what he's doing and the things he likes and his body movements and so forth, you think that's that's very encouraging. And, you know, you contrast that a little bit. I hate to keep beating on the, on the Traylon Burke situation, but when we asked him also about Traylon Burks, he said, you know, he, he certainly said there's a lot of potential. He, he liked what he saw in, in Burks, but just said, you know, I haven't been able to throw him very, very many balls so far. And, you know, he's working through some things. We're trying to get him on the field a little bit more. But, yeah, the encouraging thing in, in the passing games was certainly, I thought, both Hooper uh, and Robert Woods and, and one more, Nick Westbrook-Akina, you know, and, and again, this is this is offseason. This is seven on seven, that kind of thing, but was very active, uh, you know, caught a lot of passes out there, too. So, you know, certainly something to uh, to, to build on for, for him moving forward. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up Woods because I I think it would have been very very easy, especially what we know about Mike and John, uh, for them not to put Robert Woods back out on the field on the day that was open to the media after he went through the first day of OTAs, which was not available to us. So, he, and you know how they'll manage him after having him having gone through a little bit of an extended work period, they'll continue to you know monitor these things. The the head trainer there, Todd Torricelli, obviously. Um, as somebody who we talked to Mike about a great deal and we received no clarity on what it is exactly that Todd does, <laughs> but we know that Todd Dr. exists. Todd. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Todd, 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 Todd. Um, Robert, uh, Robert Woods being 
further along than I think most of us anticipate. I was at, I was at that Titans Foundation dinner when he talked. Yeah. And I didn't know that we could write stuff on him, but like Jimmy did. But I think Jimmy kind of <laughs> waited, uh, waited in the weeds to make sure that nobody else was doing it. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, and he had, he had said that, that the Titans were kind of holding him back a little bit from, from going as, as much as he wanted to go, which kind of back to your, to, uh, an original, uh, an, or an earlier point made about Bud Dupree and, and the way that he was handled coming in last year. I thought that was pretty notable because we all talked to Bud after they had to back him down a little bit. He was experiencing some early season issues with just general rehabilitation and, and, you know, an extended uh, workload on the knee. And at that position, it's uh, it's certainly different um, than playing the wide receiver spot. But I thought, I thought it was notable to hear that from him on last Wednesday and then to see him out on the field on Monday and Tuesday, the following basically go, I mean, not that, not to do, not the, the just like Johnny, not to bring the Traylon Burks thing up, but not like Traylon Burks. Right. Well, and he was posting, I believe, the week leading up to that, some of his own workouts on Instagram. So he was clearly putting in the work and it looked like he wanted to get that out there. Hey, by the way, look at me. I'm feeling good. The knee's feeling good. And so I, I'm not too surprised that, you know, he was available. I, I think it was a good move, honestly, if he could go and he feels comfortable. But I do wonder moving forward, like how much the Titans will try try to kind of contain him a little bit because they are so dialed in on the way that they do things with injuries. I don't think it's going to just change for one guy. I mean, they did it with Bud Dupree, who is a veteran as well. I, I, maybe it's a little different because of the position, like you were saying, Buck, uh, but I just think it's positive that Woods is looking this good early on. Uh, it's really encouraging going back to the fact that we just don't know what we're going to get in that wide receiver core this year. Yeah. I mean, and then on the other side of the ball, I mean, Caleb Farley is really the only thing that we're kind of, that we kind of have questions about, right? I know a bunch of the vets weren't here and um, you know, we got, God forbid, Amani Hooker get up on the podium and still instead of Kevin Byard, cause he's the only one available, which I just, I saw that I was, I, I had to go back to the radio studio before all the interviews took place. I saw that tweet and it, it made me so happy because mid season form already back in the saddle, kneecapping people that would dare to give us the time of day. It's tremendous. Um, but yeah, I think Caleb Farley is the only thing that we're, we're really have a, a, a substantial question mark around right now. And to see him back there also off of a, what would October ACL tear, that's a reassuring sign, at least as far as his progress is concerned, John. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mike Vrabel had sort of referenced earlier that he was starting to see, you know, more physical development from Caleb Farley. And, and he continued with that theme uh, with, with a very memorable uh, comment he had about Caleb Farley he said, you know, he's starting to fill out his uniform a little bit more. It's not like his uniform is just hanging on a coat hanger, looking like he's hung on a coat hanger right now. So we're, we're seeing development there. Caleb Farley was out there. I thought, you know, two other uh, uh, developed involved in the young guys too. Rashad Weaver, of course, uh, coming back from injury also. Yeah. Uh, you know, we saw him out there, not necessarily full participant, but, you know, no brace or anything like that. He was, he was making, you know, movements that he needed to. Uh, and this is coming off of a, of a significant injury. Uh, so I think that has to be considered in, encouraging. You know, another member of that, that draft class who has yet to kind of prove themselves, but, but, you know, has shown flashes at least. Uh, and then one that was a little bit surprising from that same draft class, uh, you know, Elijah Molden, we saw towards the end of the OTA session the other day, but did not participate at all uh, in any of the drills. And, and this is a guy who was not, at least to our knowledge, not significantly hurt at the end of last year. Uh, so you, you were left a little bit wondering, uh, you know, whether there was something significant that we just didn't know about, whether he has hurt himself off season or, you know, or, or exactly what was going on, but he was kind of limited to, uh, to just jogging uh, as, as opposed to taking part in the drills. Uh, I'm sure we'll get a full medical rundown uh, on, on that uh, next week sure. <laughs> from the, from the Titans, <laughs> but yeah, certainly. Yeah. There were some guys, uh, I agree with you, Buck, that some guys coming back from injury had to be considered very encouraging. Yeah, I, uh, I, I did not, uh, I did not have enough time while I was out there on Tuesday morning to go and to get to every spot. So I did not get to see a ton of Weaver. Um, all that, and there's a lot of questions about that, obviously, just in terms of what their depth on that highly paid pass rush is going to look like 
this coming uh, this coming season. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of good uh, there's a lot of good stuff on the defensive side of the ball. It would seem for them. Um, and the offense, you know, whether uh, just just to kind of put a bow on our conversation with the offensive line, that being really the the probably the second biggest question after the wide receiving core, just who is going to fill those two starting uh, op- uh, spots at left guard and right tackle. Um, I watched I watched a lot of offensive line stuff while I was out there on Tuesday and, you know, individual stuff. They go over all together guards, tackles and centers, and then they split off with tackles uh, and tight ends and then guards and centers staying over doing, doing a different kind of drills. That was interesting that Raiden's split off every time that they split off the tackle spot um, in kind of just paying attention to what are they going to do with him and the rookie third round pick Nicholas Petit for Kayla. I think it's great that there's even a conversation about competition. I think that that's what both of these guys probably, even though they wouldn't admit it, want. I mean, they want a competition because in my eyes, that's where you're going to see the growth of these really young players. And Raiden's especially just because we know Raiden's has struggled a bit to to kind of work his way into learning the system and, and doing things, I guess, quickly catching on quickly and now that he's had a year under his belt it seems like he's been working it seems like he's been in the film room and now you got a guy coming on from Ohio State that's very well talked about about what he did there at Ohio State who has a chance to be a starter and you're getting that competition going and I think that's exactly what the Titans need right now um, to fill that spot I think that it's a good thing I also think it's a great thing that Taylor Luan is here He's not only here and feeling better, but he's there to be a mentor. And it really looks like he wanted to go there just to be around the rookies and to be around some of these younger guys to really help them. Because when it's all said and done, that line is a fam. That line is a unit. And uh, he wants to do the best to make it sh- make sure at the start of the season it's ready to go. He, uh, I can't, I can't make it through a practice with him out there on the field without him commenting on my weight. So Taylor can kiss my ass, but I heard about this, this, this this jerk. (laughs) (laughs) What in the heck? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. We, it's, it's all love, but, uh, well, you know, and until I start to actually lose the weight, Caleb, then it can be funny. Um, but yeah, no, honestly, I think hot summer, you naturally going to lose a couple pounds there. Hot buck summer. You need to go work out with them. Uh, yeah, no, that's the last, I don't need to spend more time around them. I already, we already, it's literally already a part of our day to day. 